Tonight we have Monica Britton West um, and Allison Martinez joining us. Uh, they will have a conversation about um, succeeding as a first generation student. Monica, um, I do want to just a little housekeeping. Um, there is a question and answer section. Please feel free to um, post your questions in that um, spot. And at the uh, at the conclusion of the program, we'll go through the questions and Monica and Allison will do their best to answer them. Um, Monica Burton West is class of 91. She is an entrepreneur, alumni association board member, and a member of Zeta Phi Beta. I knew I was going to do that wrong. <laughs> And Allison um, is a class, Allison Martinez is class of 19. Um, she is actually also a second year grad student at University of Albany studying organizational leadership and development and also a sorority sister of Monica. So thank you both for joining us this evening. Thank, thank you. you so much, Carmelina and Stephanie, and uh, to the Alumni Association of my alma mater, our alma mater, Allison and mine, of the University of Albany. We're really excited to be here today. Uh, and thank you, Allison, for uh, accepting my invitation to join me. And thank you to my Alumni Association board uh, colleague, Sarah Richburg, class of 98, who suggested to the Alumni Association that I even do this tonight. Uh, tonight. Yes, it is tonight. So <laughs> thank you again uh, for this opportunity. So Allison, I guess we can just kind of jump right in, or do you want to share uh, anything just about anything about yourself? Um, no, we could like just jump right in. Um, again, like you mentioned, thank you for the opportunity. I know you mentioned it to me. I was a little standoffish about it at first, but I'm happy that you did, uh, chose me to do this because I, again, I do think that this is an important conversation because first generation does look different in many forms. And so I'm actually happy that the university is taking the initiative to really put this at the forefront. So thank you for having me. Yes, indeed, and agreed. And as Carmelina mentioned, we are members of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. We were both initiated at the University of Albany Epsilon New Chapter. I was initiated way back in spring 1991. And Allison, when were you initiated? Fall 2018. So I love this. That's what I love about sorority because you can do that. You have this sisterhood just that always exists. And um, for me to be able to reach back and bring someone on that was interested in doing it, I'm just really excited. So we can just jump right into uh, the first question that we had, which was, what is uh, your definition of a first generation college student? Now, the work that I do with my company and my business, Black Girl on Campus, is work with young Black girls, uh, grades nine through 12, who will be first generation college students because that's what I was. And also then I work with them as they move into college and then once they get out and are adulting for a little bit. So for me, once I took a look at it and I was like, well, what really is a first generation college student? Because ironically, there are about eight different uh, definitions for it that are around. So it's not just as simple as you think. For me, I use, and I don't bang my fist on the table, like this is all that I'm gonna do because at the end of the day, I want young women to win. So, but I think about what my situation was. Neither of my parents were went to college and uh, I was on my own doing the whole thing. What about you, Allison? Yeah, um, it's literally the same situation. Um, None of my parents went to college, so I was the first in my family um, to get a college degree. But interestingly enough, um, when I when I actually got into the higher education space, I started to meet people whose parents, um, they did go to college, but they went to colleges in another country. And then obviously uh, those credentials doesn't transfer over when you come to the United States. And so um, they would consider themselves first generation college students. And I'll be like, wait a minute, but like, you know, didn't your parents like go to college? And I think that was one of the first times that I was introduced to the vast amount of definitions that a first generation college student can carry. But I've definitely um, fallen to the realm of just the traditional definition of um, both parents did not attain a college degree. And I was the first person in my family to do that. And also there are, you know, because there are different tiers of it, I really encourage students to ask the university that they're interested in applying to, what is a definition of a first generation college student in your, uh, in your school? Because it can be something different outside of what Allison and I said. I know at Albany, they are um, utilizing the federal guideline, which is basically what we said, both parents did not attend college. So 
but be sure and be clear that that is what it is. So um, the next question that we were going to discuss was what was it like to be the first member of your family to go to college? Uh, Allison, I'm gonna let you start with that one because <laughs> we just talked about that because we were preparing for this the other week. And, um, and also because you're just you know, so much newer and can really share your experience. Yeah, thank you um, for asking that. I was thinking about that question and the only word that I can really think of is lonely. Like I was, I felt like I was so alone because I couldn't ask my parents like how to do, I had to learn how to do all that by myself. Like I couldn't ask them how to fill up financial aid. I couldn't ask them um, just like, what are some different resources I could use in order to like get books? Um, like all that stuff was like new to us. Like even um, TAP for example, um, and just the guidelines that, that go with that. I remember um, I didn't qualify for certain scholarships um, because um, of my mother's like immigration status. And so even though I was a United States citizen, you know, people would, would look at that as like, you are, you are eligible for these programs because of my mother's immigration status, I kind of wasn't eligible for many scholarships um, to go to college. And so when I did get into the space of being a first member of my family to go to college, it was really lonely because I really had to learn the ins and outs of higher education. And I think that's where, really where it dawned on me where that, there really is a system put in place and you have to learn it. Because if you don't know, if you don't know what you're doing, it's gonna be so easy for you to really either drop out or you know, just not finish um, out your college career. And so, um, yeah, I can honestly say at first it was lonely, but then when I actually learned, I, I feel like by my sophomore, junior year, I already was able to um, do all the paperwork by myself. So it definitely became easier. And so by the time I did graduate, I would say it was a very rewarding experience as well, because now, you know, I, not only the first person to graduate, but I'm also the first person that has attained that social and cultural capital. And I'm able to use that to help my siblings. And Allison, I'm going to veer off a little bit because I know the story, but you also have an interesting story because you also transferred to Albany and having to figure that out outside of being a first generation college student. So it's kind of like you did the first, not so much did the first gen thing twice, but in a sense, yeah, because you were at two different universities. So how did that work out for you as a transfer student, like, and, and coming into an entirely new environment? Um, so I'm going to start with where I transferred from. So for those of you who don't know, I transferred from Wells College and um, it's located in Aurora, New York. It's 20 minutes outside of Ithaca. So I was going to school in a rural town, um, only 500 students total. So everyone knew each other um, for the most part, all the professors, they didn't live far. Um, and the student, everyone who worked in student affairs um, in terms of just student activities, they lived on campus with us. So the environment was very different because we were well acquainted with each other. Everyone knew each other. Um, so it wasn't really hard to get to know anyone or to make friends. So um, when I transferred, because it was such a small school, it was also very easy to like max out your resources as well because it's such a small bubble. So, um, and it was also a private school. So um, that was kind of part of the reason why I also ended up transferring as well. And so coming to Albany, it was a, it was a culture shock. And it's so weird to say that, but it was a huge culture shock because I'm transferring from a school where I'm only going to school with about 500 students. And now I'm coming to school with 17,000 students. Um, and so it's a huge environment. And also now I have to travel to school. <laughs> so going to Wells, I just had to walk five minutes and I was in class. Whereas now um, when I transferred, I was housed on alumni. So and that's also an, another process in itself because we're also isolated from the rest of campus. So now we have to take the bus to get to campus. If you miss a certain time, you're gonna be late to class. And so it was just a huge adjustment. Oh my God, a huge, huge adjustment. But um, I do think that me coming to Albany was also a blessing in disguise as well because um, Albany is now um, placing like a large emphasis on their transfer students and really making sure that they're integrating them um, into the campus as well. So I was pretty grateful for that as well. And for myself, in terms of answering the question, I think that, you know, as I think back, because graduating in 91, this year will be 30 years that I'm removed from the university. Well, congratulations. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But it, 
I, I guess I could too say, yes, I felt lonely, but not 100% because I had a very good friend who I had gone to school with since the fifth grade, and he was there. He came to Albany as well with me. We were housed both on state quad and like a couple of um, buildings apart from each other. So we were constantly like together in that freshman year. And I think, you know, then like once we were in, <coughs> excuse me, on campus for a year, then things started, you know, getting, became okay. But as it related to me even getting things together as a first generation, similarly, like I had no one that I could turn to. Um, my parents really couldn't help me. And interestingly, at that time, my guidance counselor in school, she um, unfortunately was ill. So she was very much in and out and I didn't really get to see her. I honestly don't know how I made it <laughs> to Albany when I really think about it, because I mean, I had my mind on another college and it was out of state and my parents were like, uh, no, we're not doing that because of the cost um, and not because of grades. It was just like, we don't want to uh, spend that kind of money to send you away to school. Um, and then I, and another school that I had gotten into was a HBCU, it was a private university. And I, uh, my parents was like, we're, understand us. We're not <laughs> interested in paying that kind of money. And um I was like, okay. And then I applied to a few SUNYs and uh, Albany was on. I came to the university completely sight unseen. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know anything about it. And, uh, but at the end of the day, I always say that I landed exactly where I was supposed to because I really enjoyed my experience at the university. And uh, so much so that, you know, there had once I lived life for a little bit, then I started to want to volunteer a little bit more. And, um, and now certainly sitting on the Alumni Association board is um, really a, a cool thing to be doing as, a, as an alum and to come back to the university too and see so much has changed because I had been gone for a really long time, but now they have really made some awesome upgrades to the university and um, that I, it's, it makes me proud to say that I'm alum and I'm alum I am an alum of the university at Albany. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, what was your biggest worry coming to college as a first gen student, would you say? And how, how did you overcome that? Um, I didn't really have any worries going into college because I knew that I wanted to go away for college. The worry came when I got there <laughs> because um, so prior to going away for school, I've, I never went to school with white people ever. Like I grew up in Brooklyn, um, you know, and I, I lived in Brownsville. I went to school in Canarsie. So all those places are mostly black Caribbean people. And so going to college is the, was the first time I was the minority. So, you know, I'm learning all these new languages. Like everyone's like, yeah, you know, like, like minority this and minority and I'm like what is a minority like what are you guys talking about and <laughs> and I had to learn like this is really how the real world works and this is what it is but prior to that I would just I would say I was living really in a bubble um and this is really before like Brooklyn became gentrified and things like that so it was like I was like okay now I have I don't know how to interact with these people because I've, I never had to before um besides like when I was in um, high school or in elementary school and obviously those were my teachers but they were a person of authority it was now these are my peers and I have to interact with them so um I think that was one of my worries when I got to school because that I felt that was my first time feeling like an outcast and so I was just like I'm not really sure where I fit in so that's really where that worry came from but I was able to overcome it because I mean I didn't have a choice but to do it <laughs> and um and in doing so, it really taught me a lot about myself. Um, it taught me a lot about the world and how I had to navigate it, especially as a Black woman. And um, it's, it, I think that was really like a pivotal moment for me because it's really changed just who I am as a person and how I show up in certain spaces. I think that's awesome. And it's interesting because as I think back, I'm like, what was I thinking? And, and to hear you say like how to navigate the world as a black woman, that wasn't something that I really came to fully understand until like I was far removed from the university because things were obviously different back yeah. then. And, um, but I always say to myself and to others, like, you know, I am grateful that I went to a PWI, a predominantly white institution um, to have that kind of breath not to say that folks at hbcus don't because they have a whole other thing that's really awesome that goes on at hbcus to be around um you know the um 
just people that look like you and professors that look like you. But I actually just did had a conversation. One of my I have a podcast, and my first podcast guest was an alum of an HBCU, and she shared some great information and insight about what it is to be on the campus of an HBCU. Um, but in terms of me attending Albany and how it has played a part in how I how I've navigated life to your point about being around people from different cultures and different um, experiences and, and all of that, it was definitely uh, helpful and, and useful. As I got older, I was able to appreciate it a whole lot more. And seeing how the world is today, uh, it definitely uh, plays a huge part. But in terms of me having a worry when I came, I think my biggest worry was, was I gonna be able to deal with the, um, the, the academic rigor in terms of, you know, professors in college are not your high school teacher. Like they're not <laughs> looking out, they're not saying, oh, you missed that test, all right, you know, whatever. Like they're not giving a whole bunch of extra credit necessarily. It's not all of this hand-holding as it is like when you're in high school. And I was like really uh, concerned about that and how would I manage and, and how would I manage life? Because, you know, you can get up and go to, co you can get up and go to class or not. And no one's really going to care one way or the other. Like, you know, I don't think, you know, there are those professors certainly that will probably be like, okay, you miss an, you've missed my class. I know that I heard that a lot from students in um, EOP, like, because they have that, that yeah, support right. system that's so built in and so awesome. Um, they, they, they heard that and they were really carried along. But as a first gen who was general admit, it was kind of like being out there on your own and trying to um, figure it out, especially then. And I know that the university has done some things, a lot of different things to uh, make students feel more involved and engaged and <laughs> all of that. But the, that was probably my biggest concern, the academic rigor and like, you know, how would I figure it out if I needed um, a tutor? Like what, what would I do? Did I even think oh, yes, about so getting true. a tutor? Like, <laughs> what what was class going to be like? And then especially going into the campus center, not the campus center, like um, a lecture center at Albany, and it's so big, and like you're just kind of one in like hundreds. And but I like that. I was interested when you said you went to a school that was like 500 students. I was like, I was gonna <laughs> touch on that too because then it was funny because I I went to that. I was I got used to that environment. Um, so I got used to being, um, you know, um, I love the only black girl in my classes all the time. Um, but when I came to Albany, that was the culture shock because I came to Albany and then I was like, oh my God, there's so many black people here. Like, and I was like, <laughs> but I was like, what is going on? So like, it was just a lot because I'm like, wow, now I'm going to school, um, with people who look like me, but it's so many of them and I no longer feel alone. And one of the things that I appreciated about you, Albany, was that all the students were always welcoming. Um, and I, it was, e it was a lot easier for me to get acclimated, um, at U Albany because there were so many people there that I was like, okay, you're new. I'm going to show you the ins and outs of the school, um, who pointed me in the right direction of just like faculty who are always willing to help students. If I had an idea, they were like, okay, I know an administrator you can go to and present this to them and they're going to carry your way through. So I think coming to U Albany, like you said, was also you like, I was right where I needed to be. Um, because it also did push me because now, um, yes, I'm going to school with a lot of people who do look like me, but at the same time now, like the, I don't know the right, I have to think about what I'm going to say, but it's like, this, I'm going to school with a lot of people who look like me, but at the same time, they're also like on my level. Like we all, we're all smart. We all have like a network and like, we're all willing to help each other. And I think that's why I was like, wow, like. I really do appreciate coming to you openly because it wasn't really that hard for me to get acclimated, but it was a, a culture shock when I did come um, in terms of the academic um, rigor because um, going to Wells, a lot of um, my finals, I just had to write a paper. So a lot of it was research-based. Um, and so I was just used to writing essays to, um, for my finals, but then coming to you Albany and then going from a class of just like maybe 10 to 12 people to now, the lecture center with like over 100, 300 students, I was, I, I was, I almost had an anxiety attack. Like it was just a lot because that's where I really did feel like a number, but also in terms of having to, um, I kind of call it like a regression because I had to go from 
being acclimated to just writing papers to now studying for exams again, which I used to do in high school, but I was just so far off from it and I had to bring myself back. So I think um, that was probably the only worry as well when I got here was just like, I'm not really used to the studying aspect of it, but this is what I need to do to pass, so. <laughs> exactly, <clears throat> excuse me. So how was your transition uh, from high school to college as a first generation college student, do you feel that you were prepared for the post-secondary academic environment? We just talked a little bit about that, but did you feel prepared? Um, I did feel prepared because I was part of a program called College Confident. Um, and so I had a college advisor who would, um, she not only partnered with my school, but she partnered with different schools across New York City. So she took us, she started mentoring us around our junior year and we would take college trips like we visited so many schools i remember going to syracuse northeastern lemoyne college we went to ithaca college like we went to all different types of schools we went to boston university um i think harvard was on the list as well so we were always visiting different schools um so i think i was prepared in terms of just how that the environment would be but i think i wasn't prepared for when I got there and how I was supposed to navigate being in that space. And I say, and what I mean by that was just like, okay, I did everything I had to do to get to college. I know what I have to do in order to pass, but at the same time, I don't know what I don't know. And I think that's um, where I was like, okay, yes, I was prepared because I was able to see different colleges. I know um, like, you know, small scale, large scale, large scale schools, um, you know, and I understand that, I understand the, just the face value, seeing schools at face value, like, cause you know, as a high school student, you're going to college and you're just like, oh my God, the food here is so good. This is pretty, you're looking at how pretty the dorms are, but you're not really thinking about when you're actually there, what are you going to do? And so, um, I do think I was prepared in terms of just like knowing maybe what kind of school I wanted to go to, but I think I wasn't prepared in the aspect of, um, what was my learning style and where, where, what did I have to do in order to not only advance my skills and also make sure that like, I'm up to date with everything that I know what kind of websites I need to go to in terms of just like getting books. Um, like I didn't even know like you could just go on like Amazon or you could find like PDF versions online. I didn't know things like that. So like I'm spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars on textbooks that I could get for free or I could rent. So um, I do think, yes, I was prepared, I guess, because I knew what school I wanted to go to, but no, at the same time, because I think that I wasn't really given the ropes in order to navigate being in a college setting. I would say um, similarly, um, you know, I felt prepared from my high school, although yeah. I wasn't in any type of a program or anything like that, but yeah. I just felt prepared. I think from things that I had done in high school, um, activities I had participated in, there was one professor who was uh, not professor, but teacher. He was a young he was a young guy, like he was probably like in his early 20s and he was like our science teacher and he was a, just really cool and you could have like a lot of great conversations with him, I remember that. <clears throat> um, so in terms of going, I felt prepared in that regard, um, I guess academic wise. I don't know to your point about just knowing where to go for certain resources because it wasn't um, like, you know, when you're having problems with a, with something in high school, you go to the teacher, the teacher is like, okay, they can walk you through. If you're in a lecture center with a class with like 300 people and you go up to the professor or even the um, grad assistant, it's like, okay, yeah, like they can try to do something, but it's, you know, it's a lot. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> overwhelmed. So it was, mm -hmm. you know, it was, I felt prepared, but I think in, a, in certain ways I was, I was definitely scared and nervous. I was excited and I'm just really grateful to, if he's even watching my friend, Michael Smith, that's who it was who came, who was with me from fifth grade. And we went to Albany together because he was just, just having another person there just really um, eased my anxiety as well. Just before I made friends, before I, you know, got into uh, doing different things at the university. So I guess, yeah, I felt I felt prepared. As prepared as I as I could be, I think, based on my circumstance. <clears throat> um, what helped you most in your first year of college? Would you say 
uh, and even, you know, maybe even further sophomore, junior, senior year, but whatever, but definitely your first year, what do you feel like helped you the most? Um, my first year, I think what helped me most was that I got involved. Um, and I think that's really, <laughs> that's really, um, where I think I, I, I call it my blessing because I'm very curious, but that can also be a curse too. Um, but I'm, because I'm so curious, I was always willing to just get involved somewhere or somehow. And I had a professor my first year of college, um, Professor Renfro, and he was my sociology professor. And he was one of the first people um, who introduced me to um, my opportunity I got to be part of um, community court as sophomore representative. So, um, and that was like my first time being involved on campus where um, I really had to work more so, um, have like a restorative approach with students who um, were caught um, or who are on academic probation or they were caught um, doing things like plagiarism and things like that. So. Um, I was like part of that. So that was pretty cool. And then I, after that, shortly after that, I became president of Umoja, which is, um, which at the time was the only black um, student organization for people of color on campus. So um, I, I got involved and once I got involved, I think that that's where a lot of my leadership skills were tested. So I had to, I had to educate myself because the only way I could help other people is if I had access to information and I know what I'm talking about. So I think that helped me the most. Um, and also just having like really good friends. I was able to go to school um, with my friends from high school. So we were a support system for each other. And I'm very, very appreciative of that as well. Um, and yeah, I had, a, I also had a mentor who was a senior at the time and she, um, she really, made sure that she pushed me because she was also from Brooklyn. And when I got to college, I wasn't exactly the nicest person. So she really, um, really molded me to really understand that. Um, Cause I think it's something of having to grow up in New York city, going through the New York city public school system, you're always in a, in a state of survival. So when I got to college, it was like, you know, people are telling me good morning. I'm like, why is this person telling me good morning? <laughs> like, and it's like, I had to learn like, these are manners. And when you see someone smile, say hello. But you know, New York, you're just kind of like going and going and going. So you're not really paying attention to the people around you. So I definitely think having mentors, my first year of college helped me a lot in terms of just my character, um, growing as a leader. And then um, that led it, that fed into my sophomore year as well before I left Wells. And then coming into, um, Albany, my junior year, I actually got involved with Asuba. Um, so I joined Asuba my my junior year when I when I first got to um U Albany, and I remember I was involved in the political action chair committee, the political action committee, and I had a specific idea. I wanted to take students to Yale, which I was able to do my senior year. Um, and because I was like so adamant about this idea, I'm like I want to take these students to um the I should know it, but it's a black student conference that happens at Yale um, every February during Black History Month. So I really wanted to take students there. And I was like, how do I make this happen? And um, at the time, the chair of my committee actually pointed me to ECWO. Um, and that's how I met ECWO. And ECWO kind of took me under the wing and became a mentor for me as well. So I feel like he really helped me my junior and my senior year. And that was kind of like the person that connected with me with pretty much everyone at the university. So. For me, it was um, working, I had work study. So I was working in the history department and that was the thing that I think helped me the most to like open my eyes outside of going to class, going back to my dorm and not just having any other outside. There were the two women that worked in there. I will always remember their first names, Debbie and Tammy. And they were so nice and so helpful just in terms of connecting me to things that I needed on campus or didn't know about. And also um, after that and, and being involved with them, I also, or working anyway, I got involved with the um, campus radio station, WCDB, because at that time I wanted to be, um, <clears throat> when I went to Albany, I was thinking, oh, I want to be a newscaster. I want to be like a reporter, but really more a newscaster, like the person that sits at the desk. <laughs> I didn't want to be out on the street. and. Um, <laughs> I was like, well, let me get my chops up and, and go and work at the uh, radio station. And it was really cool. Um, you know, some, you had to write your own stuff. You had to write your own copy. And then you had to say the news in between like breaks. <clears throat> and it was 
so much fun. I was always so very nervous, but it also gave me like a great uh, insight into ultimately like, you know what? No, I don't want to do this. And, and I didn't want to be a newscaster. And it was good to have that experience to learn that I didn't, that wasn't something that I really wanted to do necessarily. And then um, <clears throat> after that, got involved, got involved with uh, Res Life and I became a student assistant and then ultimately a RA, a resident assistant. Um, both on Indian Quad, and that was super fun. Oh, I'm sorry, Indigenous Quad, because that's the name of it now. And um, but back then it was Indian, and um, it was just. But those things like all came together and helped me. Um, just really, the the SA and RA positions were really the place that I really honed my leadership skills and my, um, you know, just the you know person. Not so much being in charge, but just having to make decisions and be creative and, and all of those things. So I think that, but for my first year, it was definitively uh, working my work study role because that just opened up my eyes to a whole bunch of different things at the university <clears throat> outside of my major as well, which was English. What was your major? My major was sociology. <sighs> so um, what is a common struggle that you notice among first year students, particularly first gen students? And I think, cause I'm trying to look in the Q and A too. And I think that might've been kind of a question somebody had. So. Um, I think one of the, one of the common struggles, um, and I, I, I say that because I've also felt victim to it myself was um, really the lack of confidence and kind of feeling like your voice doesn't matter. Um, and I feel like a lot of that just comes from, again, you're the first, there's so much pressure for you to make it. You have to, you know, help everybody. And you're coming from an environment where everyone is relying on you to be successful. And if you're not successful, you feel as if you failed everybody else. And so I think those two coupled with the fact that um, not putting themselves first, and that's something that I had to learn because we take on so much, we want to be overachievers, but in the midst of overachieving, we burn out. And then once we burn out, we don't really know what to, where to go, or what to do, because we hit a certain wall. And so um, I, I definitely see that amongst first generation college students. And I, I, it's something that I struggled with for a long time, because I wanted, I remember wanting to be successful so bad that I was just taking on all these jobs. Like, Throughout going to school my whole life, I've always had a job. And it's because I had to have a job in order to support myself. But on top of having a job, I was also involved on campus. And then on top of being involved on campus, I wanted to take on leadership roles. So I'm just juggling all, I'm having, putting on all these hats. And then by the end of the day, it's like, sometimes I don't even have time to complete my, my homework. And so um, a lot of that really became very, very overwhelming. And um, to the point where, my first time, I, the first time I ever had a mental breakdown was when I was in college. And um, I didn't really know much about just like um, mental health. I didn't really know much about therapy because I come from a family that when you go to therapy, people are assuming that you're crazy. So um, college was the first space where I was able to be open to the idea of therapy, but also learn how to um, not only be confident in putting my ideas on the table, um, without worrying about how people are going to look at me, but also knowing when to take a step back. And again, that's still something I'm practicing and, and understanding that it's okay if you cannot get something done at a certain time, you know, as long as you're making sure that you're being productive and you're also managing your time well. So I think that um, that is definitely a struggle as well, because, you know, we go to college, we feel like we have all the time in the world, and then we end up doing all these things because we feel like we have time, we're not really managing it the correct way, which ends up leading to the burnout. So um, I definitely think, yeah, it's taking on a lot. <laughs> it has to stop. <laughs> yes, but what do you think is a common struggle that you see, especially even now? Because um, I'm actually interested in seeing, like, what did you see when you were in all when you were in Albany as a student, but also now um, working with um, young black girls who are in the K through 12 um, education. I would say uh, one of the common struggles then was um, just feeling like you, I didn't know what I was doing, what I was doing, where I was going. Um, and I think that that's a common struggle with uh, that. For me, that's what it was then. Present day, I think, first generation or first year and first year students are come in. A lot of them come in pretty 
clear like that this is what they they know they want to go to college i knew i wanted to go to college as well so did my parents but you know it was almost like well i want to go to college because that's what you that's what i'm supposed to do like that's the next thing that i'm supposed to do um and if and in the career that i wanted at the time it was like well i guess i, I yeah i gotta go to college i gotta get a journalism degree i have to do something to be able to become a um a newscaster but now in in my work with black girl on campus it's like students are clear that they want more students are clear that they want to go to college and why but the issue comes in with well, how am i going to pay for it and where am i going to go and what would my major be like how does my what would my major be to tie into this is what i want to do and and also not having anybody really to ask because years ago and the reason why i started black girl on campus too was because i was running into a lot of young um young ladies who were and the reason it's black girl on campus because people are always like why just girls is because like i i'm a woman and yeah certainly i could speak to and the information i give is is uh, universal but you know i'm a woman and i can certainly uh relate more to young women as opposed to like young men who are challenged with getting into college or not knowing the directions to take but it's like so many, there are so many programs out there, but not really knowing what to do. Like so many guidance counselors are incredibly overwhelmed. That's why I started, <clears throat> excuse me, Black Girl on Campus. I was had the uh, privilege to shadow a guidance counselor and she was working with, and she only had to work with 12, the, the 12th grade with seniors, but there were over a hundred seniors. There was like 120. So it's like, how does she serve all of these students and I was sitting in the office with her and it was just like incredibly overwhelming, even for me, like trying to help her to do it at the time. And I was like, yeah, it really seems like there's a need for what I'm thinking that I wanna do. And I have you know, seen for sure, once I launched, it was just like, people were like, this is great. This is what we need. And, and it's been a wonderful experience. But I think that you know the common struggle is just really absolutely not knowing which, which direction to go to even 100% start like there were students coming into her office that didn't understand the FAFSA didn't know the FAFSA you know then they got to go ask their parents for um you know their, their tax returns and it, it it's yeah. it's a, it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot of struggle along the path but if you stay committed to it and you know that you really want to do it it's going to absolutely uh, work out for you and it's it is I think the things to do going to college is the thing to do I think in this age, in this day, <laughs> even though people are like, oh, I don't want to go to college or, you know, people are becoming entrepreneurs. Like, certainly I can say it. I'm an entrepreneur now, but there are things that you can get in college as it relates to like having to run your business that you should get and should do just as opposed to running out and jumping out the window and, you know, becoming an entrepreneur. I'm not trying to stop anybody's money, but just make sure that you know what you're doing as it relates to the business side of things. So, um, Oh, we talked a little bit about this though. Um, but as a first generation college student, were you involved on campus and how did that influence your leadership? Certainly we everyone knows that's on. They know we're members of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, uh, the best sorority, I'll just say that. Uh, founded January 16th, 1920, uh, on the campus of Howard University. <laughs> and uh yeah, you can learn more at z5b1920.org. But were you involved? Uh, and and how did that influence your leadership? Yeah, so. There were a few points um, I would say that really heavily influenced my leadership. The first one being um, my sophomore year when I was at Wells, and that was the time I became president um, for Umoja. But at the time of me being president, so at the time um, I was also cross regist registering at Cornell. So I took classes at Cornell, and that's but that same year. Um, my best friend who was a student at Ithaca College, he um, was killed on Cornell's campus. So it was it was a lot because I was taking classes there, then I was president of um, Umoja, but then obviously because we went to high school together, I also had like friends um, from my high school who were attending the school and then he, we were, he would often visit. And so like a lot of people at my, at my school knew who he was. So it's like, it, that was a pivotal factor in my leadership because now I'm in, I'm obviously I'm in a leadership position. I just lost my best friend. Yes, I'm mourning, but my campus is mourning too. 
And then also at the same time, I have to take classes at the campus that, you know, he passed away at. So um, I think that was really the first time where I learned that, um, you know, as a leader, there's going to be times where, yes, you're going to go through, maybe not, maybe not that drastic, but you're going to go through these these challenges and you, you're gonna have to pick pick a like pick a struggle. Um, and so I didn't step down from my leadership. I feel like a lot of people thought that I was, but um, I kind of used that in order to not only um, kind of reassure the campus like they, they will be safe. Um, like if they need to talk, I'm here as a resource, but please give me some time because obviously I'm still mourning. Um, but still being able to like go and make sure that I had a program um, to talk about, again, mental health, talk about where, like get a temperature um, check on everyone, how are they feeling? And after that, a lot of people really thanked me um, for even just having a program. And they were like, you know, like we know that you're going through a lot and you're internalizing a lot, but like we're really grateful that you planned this program and you still, you know, decided to come up and show out. And we know that you were very, very greatly impacted by that. So that really um, was the first time that that influenced my leadership as well. That was also the first time I had to do a grievance form or like a budget and present it in front of um, the student council. And so I was really nervous about that because <laughs> I never, I'd never done it um, ever. And so that was my first time doing it. I was able to get a budget for my organization um, and so that was like pretty cool as well, because then I, I learned um, just about the financial aspect of um, leading an organization. And then coming to U Albany, um, I got involved with the Center for Leadership and Service, where I became an emerging leader. And um, with Martha, Martha is really great for everyone. If you know Martha Asplund, she is amazing. Oh my gosh, <laughs> she is so amazing. She's the reason I was able to study abroad on um, study abroad in Spain, like we talked about earlier. Um, and I remember after class, she came to me. Well, she was like, Allison, like, can you stay behind after class? And I thought I was in trouble. So I was like, oh my God, maybe I'm in trouble. I don't know what that is. <laughs> and um, she was like, you know, at the time she was actually spearheading a trip to Scotland, but the trip was like in two weeks. So she was like, she was like, hey, um, she was like, I'm going to be spearheading a trip to Scotland. You should come. It's going to be fun. And I looked at her. I said, Martha, where am I going to get money to go to Scotland? Like, cause she's like laying out all the fees. She's like, I'll help you pick out a plane ticket. I was like, Martha, I do not have any money. I'm not studying abroad. <laughs> and then she was like, no, we're going to figure something out. And she was really like, she really made it her business to make sure that she got me a study abroad opportunity. And like a, maybe a few weeks after, um, she made an appointment with me to go to her office and she, she actually went and she looked up, um, study abroad scholarships for, um, black women and also students of color so i applied to the scholarship i applied to the school scholarship as well and it was so funny because i didn't get the school scholarship but i was able to get um the benjamin a gilman scholarship which actually covered the cost um to go to spain but and they also gave me pocket money while being abroad and so i always thank martha for that but it all it really started because i was like girl i don't got no money i don't know why you're telling me to study abroad she was like no we're gonna figure it out and she and she really did like and so i'm i'm very very grateful for martha so she's still one of my mentors to this day. I call her for everything. Um, <laughs> and then obviously um, my senior year, that's when I joined um, the Exquisite Epsilon chapter and I became public relations chair. And I think what they, one of the things Zeta really pushed me to do was um, get better at public speaking. I always said, I wanna get better at public speaking. I wanna get better at public speaking. And um, I remember saying that, but I was just always so scared. Like there'll be times like people will talk to me and like I would be so soft-spoken, even speaking now, I'm, I'm surprised I'm really not as nervous as I was before, but anyone who has seen me in that stage like understands how I used, used to just freeze up. And um, it was really bad. <laughs> it was really bad. And I remember, um, like Lanji, she used to just be like, okay, come to my room. We're gonna practice, um, you know, we're gonna do like role play and then you're gonna pretend you're speaking about this topic and you're gonna do it. And she would like put me in, in front of her room and just make me talk. And so um, that kind of helped me as well. And then I, that's when I found my passion for marketing because I was appointed public relations chair. So, I mean, I, I always like doing flyers but I kind of just did it when I had to do it. 
And then now being public relations chair for Zeta, I had to do it all the time, but I loved it. And I think that that's really, it's still a passion of mine now. Like if I could get a job in marketing and advertising, I would do it because that is, that's something I, I think I could do for the rest of my life. So I'm grateful that um, Zeta really pushed me not only to just go up, like go above and beyond myself and not sell myself short because I was just so used to doing that. But I feel like just being part of the organization and seeing women who have really broken those barriers and have become entrepreneurs um, that is doing the work in the community. And, you know, and they, they've come from similar struggles that I have. I was like, well, you know, I can do it too. So, so that's really, um, I feel like where a lot of like my influence came from in terms of my leadership and also being, um, working for the student association as well. And um, just learning how to work with stakeholders and being able to go to a room. And like I mentioned earlier, like lay out an idea, but you know, understanding, and that's what I also learned, like you can't just go in a room, say what, an, what your idea is, but not really have a plan for it. So I learned um, to just understand like, okay, if I wanna see something happen, I have to make sure that I got the blueprint before I go into these rooms. So, um, I think that's really made me a very strategic and attentive leader that I am now. And I'm, I'm excited to see where, where I go next, so. That is awesome. I think the, the thing that um, I will say initially is that, you know, the university so much has changed, um, not so much even the um, aesthetically, how the university looks like dorms and <clears throat> adding buildings and stuff like that, but also programming, because there are things that happen now that weren't happening uh, when I was on campus, like um, the Ambassadors, which is an awesome, awesome program. And I know that uh, Langey was one and um, a couple other people that I know uh, in our blue and white sorority fraternity family were involved in Ambassadors. Then they also have the, um, the student senators that didn't exist uh, when I was on campus and stuff. So that type of programming put in place to allow students to uh, get leadership skills outside of you know being in a club being in something like that or an organization and seeking out <clears throat> excuse me opportunities i'm really glad that that type of thing exists and for me quickly it was probably like i mentioned earlier definitively when i became an essay that was one thing a student assistant but definitely when i became an ra in my senior year was the thing that really helped me um really start to hone my um my, my leadership skills, understand them, relating to people, relating to people, uh, you know, different personalities, because certainly you're over an entire hall, even though you have a co-RA, but like, you know, you two run it together with how many, however many rooms we were um, in a low rise, we were in Mohican, and it wow. was a uh, shout out, he, I know he's not listening because he's um, a, 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 a doctor, but uh, my co at the time, um, Sandeep Garwin is awesome, he was awesome, we had a great uh, working relationship together, but um definitely becoming an RA was awesome I mean and, and please it was you know free room and board so why why wouldn't I want that but it was work too but it was so much fun and engaging with the students and and creating programs and all of that and it was something that I took between that and I also joined uh Zeta Phi Beta sorority um <clears throat> Epsilon new chapter in my senior year so between that and uh and becoming a member of the organization, those things have carried with me moving forward in my life, like things that I learned then and just built upon in terms of uh, leadership. And I love how you shared just in terms of like, you know, sorority and how Langey brought you into her room, like to like really work with you on um, your speaking and all of that. That was probably one of the things, definitely one of the things that I was looking for in becoming a member of the sorority too even though I joined and basically I joined in the spring and I graduated, but it didn't change because like, you know, in our construct in the uh, National Panhellenic Council, it's, you know, it's like a lifelong thing. It doesn't stop when you graduate. So it, I was able to, you know, learn so much from members of the organization, um, even to this day, learning different things, connections, networking, it's just an, a, an amazing opportunity. So I would say, um, getting involved in, in res life in that regard. And, you know, even at the radio station and stuff like that, it was helpful, but definitively, you know, between that and Zeta, those were the things for me that uh, influenced my leadership. Um, I know that we have some questions and we have a few more minutes, but I do want to ask you uh, one more question before we jump into the Q&A, which is, uh, what is one thing that you would advise first year and first generation students to look out? for when arriving on campus, any campus, it doesn't, you know, cause it's universal. It doesn't necessarily have to be Albany, certainly. 
No, that I have to kind of think about that. Um, yeah, I actually have to think about that now. Um, I think one thing that you should definitely um, look out for when you first arrive on campus, I think it's really, really important to ask questions more so like about the library um, and ask about like the databases and, and um, you know, where you, well, how you can be able to like, you know, either rent books to the school or like even, I know at you at U Albany, if you don't have a book, um, there are books on reserve at the library. So you don't necessarily have to spend money. You can just go to the library and take out the book on reserve for how many hours that you need it for. And even sometimes I think you can take it out for a day. And so I think like really like learning like where different things are. So, and not waiting until you need the service to ask. Cause I think by then it's too late. So, um, and even like, I, I just found out I'm a graduate student that you can actually go um, into the UAlbany database and I look up like a dissertation or um, any resource that you need. And if, if the school doesn't have it, the school will order it for you at, a, at free cost. Yeah, I just found that as a grad student. I know, I was like, wow, when was this? But yeah, so like there are ways that you can save money. You don't have to do everything by yourself. And I think that's, that's something that um, I had to tell myself as well is that any opportunity that I got, anything I was able to do, I didn't do it by myself. Like I, I got it because someone saw me, they took a chance on me and they knew that I was able to do the work. So we were never in places because we did things by ourselves. I know we like to say that narrative, but that's not true. Um, and so I think that you should definitely um, look out for that. I, I say library because I like to read, but also just like knowing like where are your immediate resources? Like where's the office of the president? Where's the financial aid office? Where's the student affairs office? So that when you do need that service, you know exactly where to go and you're not just trying to figure it out by yourself. And I would say um, seek out opportunities where you can network with alumni I mean, it's certainly being on the Alumni Association board, that's something that's uh, big with me. And like I mentioned, the ambassadors program that Albany has, and I'm sure other universities have it as well, or um, just something that uh, if there's, like, I know Albany has uh, UCAN, which allows alum and students to engage with alumni and for professional development and things like that, because I've been in spaces with um, ambassadors and, <clears throat> For instance, like at the Excellence Gala that the Alumni Association has and is coming up actually in a couple of weeks um, that the ambassadors were there and they were really just moving around the room. I mean, it's nothing but alumni in that room. So it's like your opportunity to connect with people uh, who could potentially give you a, get you a job, an internship, something that you, that's, you know, life moves on networking. It does, it's not about necessarily, yes, you can have great grades and have a great resume, but really life moves on networking and who you know. So if you're in a room with a bunch of alumni and you don't have to necessarily be an ambassador, just get into those spaces to try to be um, where they are, take advantage of stuff like at Albany with you can to connect. I know that uh, Sarah, who I mentioned earlier, uh, who's also on the board with me, she's on UCAN and she's talking to me constantly about how students are connecting with her. So I get resume review and interview questions and those types of things. Take advantage of that because she has, you know, started some initiatives downstate because of that and brought you, know, you Albany students into them because they reached out to her. We can't help, alumni can't help you if they don't know that you exist. So I think that that's one of the biggest things that I would say. And also um, you mentioned earlier, and I wanted to touch back on it, was when you talked about like the mental health support because Albany has Middle Earth and uh, I believe they just uh, a couple years ago, if it wasn't last year or something, they celebrated, I think a, a milestone anniversary, like 50 or 60 years of the services that they provide. I never knew about, I knew about Middle Earth. Let me not say I didn't know, but it wasn't something that I wanted to take, I didn't take advantage of. And I encourage students definitively, especially as you know, this whole COVID thing has been going on um, for students to take advantage. Like when you don't feel like 100% yourself, yeah, your armchair friends are great and they can give you insight, but there's nothing like getting some support from like a professional and there's nothing, no shame in that. And I know that in our community, when I say our, I mean the African-American community, the stigma is starting to wane a little bit, but it was really, like you said earlier, it was a huge stigma, like, oh, you're crazy. Like, if you got to go talk to somebody, you're crazy. Like, what's the problem? But it's definitely getting a lot better, and I am a full uh, proponent of people getting uh, uh, mental health support when they need it. So definitely seek that out. Seek out 
um, because uh, all universities have that. It's not just Albany. They're not called Middle Earth, every other place, but every university has mental health support for students. And if you feel you need it, please 1000% take care of it. <clears throat> so I'm gonna um, look in the chat real quick and see if they're, oh, yay. Oh my, oh, my cousin is on. She, oh, wow. My cousin uh, slash little sister, she uh, went to Albany. She came after me. Like I was graduating in the uh, spring and she came in the fall of that year. And she's saying that uh, she was a middle health counselor, which I did not know. <laughs> and uh, she received a lot of calls, which is um, totally uh, cool. Um, oh, and someone put, thank you, Margaret, the uh, link for, uh, you can is alumni.albany, <clears throat> if you're not in the Zoom chat, it's alumni.albany.edu slash you can, the letter U C A N. Um, so let's look at some of the questions. Um, I think you kind of answered that. Um, about, or Carmelina, did you want to hop back in? Um, um, I think you pretty much covered most of them. Um, I think you're doing a great job. I think once uh, somebody asked, um, how much of your day with working and clubs and studying seems like a lot. How can you suggest some strategies that will help balance in it all? Allison, you want to take Because <laughs> <laughs> you've been doing such a great job at it, like, you know, just from someone outside of looking in. So, and again, just, just, just like so closer, so much more closer. Um, well, my responsibilities have changed since undergrad. But I, in undergrad, um, I wasn't the best time management person, so I really can't speak to my undergrad experience because I was just doing everything on a whim. Um, but and when I got my, to my first year of grad school, which I would definitely say, um, and I remember I had a conversation with Sam. So if anybody doesn't know Sam, Samuel Carlo, he's the chief interim diversity officer at the university, and he's also my frat brother. He's my favorite. And he was one of the first people that was like, Allison, you have to sit down and you really have to plan out your day. Like the night before, write a to-do list, write down like three top priorities that you need to get done. You absolutely need to get done because there's always going to be things to do. Um, and then take care of that in the morning. But for the most part, you have to keep a schedule for yourself. Um, so one of the ways that I do that now, which I'm way better at time management now is, I, so I have my Outlook calendar. And my Outlook calendar is really there because it's connected to my phone. So um, I get a reminder 15 minutes before like any appointment or meeting that I have. But then I also have um, my huge, I have like a huge calendar like up here, but I have like a huge um, calendar and I, I, that's where I write down everything that I need to write down. So I'm not only getting reminders from my phone, but when I wake up, my calendar is the first thing that I see in the morning. And then again, writing down um, the top three priorities that you need to get done. In terms of how many hours um, I dedicated to like clubs and just like my extracurricular activities. Um, and undergrad, it really was the whole day. Like I remember leaving the campus center when the campus center was closing and that was like around 11 p.m. There was days um, I stayed in the student association office overnight and just doing not only homework, but also doing work that I just needed to get done um, in my position. So it, it, was, it was really like an all day, everyday thing. But I feel like if there were the things that I know now, had I done it when I was an undergrad, it definitely probably would have been a game changer for me. And I would say, um, I think that what uh, Samuel, Sam told you in terms of the top, uh, top three things, priorities, that goes for in college, that goes for out of college, like because life obviously is crazy out of college, going to work and just balancing life. But figuring out those top three things that you absolutely have to get done that day, because in that way, it's like a small win. So you feel accomplished. Like I did get something done as opposed to just looking at, because we all have endless to-do lists. But like, you know, if you're just kind of, you know, ticking things off or, or not, like it, it can become frustrating. So I think those top three things definitively are helpful. And I also, I would say, you know, writing, writing things down, absolutely. If, for me, I used to be very, I am very techie, but I have found in recent years, it's better for me to write things down. And I think it is because like, when you write things down, it's like, it's kind of just an extra thing that's just in your head. So while it's in, you're writing it down, it's in your phone, if it's on your wall, like you have, I think that that's, um, a great way to also stay clear on what like, you know, your myriad of things are to do. And then also, as my mentor says, have a good no, you have to be able to say no to things <laughs> like you can't 
always, and I'm, that will help you as an adult, like as a full adult, like when you're out adulting, going into the world, going to work, you know, getting into other organizations, being able to say no, that I just don't have the bandwidth to do that right now. And, and if you want to take something on, being clear that, you know what, I might need to let go of something else to be able to participate in this at the, at the level in which I want to uh, be involved in it. So I think those three things. Um, then there's a, there's two questions, but they kind of um, are hand in hand. So the, these both questions are being that both of you are first generation college students, um, how did you, who did you lean on for direction, specifically like applying to schools, finding funding, choosing a college? And then the other question was, um, how does a student find a mentor to help navigate the college experience? I know, uh, Monica, you touched on um, finding alums to mentor you, but I think this question is more like, you know, while you're at college, who could you kind of look to to help? I would say, um... The first one, in terms of who did I who did I lean on? Honestly, it was um, my peers, like other like my friends that were applying at the same time. Like I mentioned earlier, my guidance counselor wasn't really that available, and her counterpart had her own student course load to deal with. So it was a lot of trial and ever error, a lot of just trying to figure it out on my own. What were my friends doing? Um, also that teacher that I mentioned, the science teacher, he was helpful in some instances. So it was hard. And that's why, you know, I, I, like I said earlier, you know, in starting Black Girl on Campus is to kind of take the overwhelm out of that. Like, so you're just not like floating in the sky, like, okay, what direction do I go in this time or for this? Who do I talk to for this? How do I, you know, how do I read this award letter? Like, what, what is this? Like, how do I, what is happening? Um, and then in terms of a mentor, I would say, you know, I ultimately was able to find uh, mentors uh, through in, in college professors, like uh, Allison mentioned earlier, there was one professor in my English department, Barbara McCaskill, she's long gone, last I knew she was um, at Emory in Atlanta, but she just, finding that professor that you feel like you, or professors that you feel like you connect with, and, um, going up to them, going to office hours, talking and, and being transparent and talking about what it is that you need and what, where you need support in. And by and large, they, I think that they will, they're there to assist, they're there to help you. They're just not there to you know, be like, okay, get this done, here's the syllabus and figure it out. But <clears throat> they, if you really get the connection and almost kind of like be a squeaky wheel too, because like when people, when you're constantly around, you know, people will always remember you and they will, uh, when something comes up or they'll always want to check in or check in on you to see how you're, how you're feeling and how you're doing. If you're uh, visible, like, I think that's the biggest thing. You have to be visible. You can't, you know, be in a, in a box. You can't go to class and then go into your room and be like, gosh, I don't know anybody. Like, you know, you have to step out and make that, make those, um, make those relationships and make those entrees yourself. That's the time. That's one of the biggest things that I love about going to college is that, you know, your parents aren't there holding your hand. Like this is really your time to step up and step into who you're going, uh, who the type of person that you're going to be and advocate for yourself. Alice. I definitely agree. Um, yeah, just like really, really quickly. Um, something you said in terms of um, like finding a professor. Um, that stuck out to me because I had a, I had a specific professor in my sociology department, um, Elizabeth Pop Berman. She's, she's, um, yeah, she's also long gone as well. She um, recently got hired at the University of Michigan. But me and her, we still email each other. We still talk every day. And it's because um, I remember that was me being an overachiever, but I got, I think <laughs> um, I was doing very, very well on my, on my exams. I think I always got like around like 90s. Um, and this one specific exam, I got around the 75 and I just, I didn't know why. And so I remember I went to her and I was in her office and I was like, you need to tell me what I need to do because I need to change this. Like, and she was like, okay, like, you know, but thankfully a lot of professors, they would drop the lowest grade, but she really sat down. She worked with me. She gave me skills on how can I make my writing better? Um, what are some things I can do for the next exam that would help me? And it was literally like that for every exam. So even to the point that when I did start, um, you know, going back to the usual of getting like A plus A's um, on my, my exams, I still would just go to her office hours and just talk to her. Or like if I was having a bad day, I'm like, okay, I need advice or something. Like, can you tell me like what to do? And so I think like 
like um Monica said, like be visible because because I always just went up to her after class and we would just talk about like her day. Like she remembered me and then she actually ended up um not only helping me with my PhD application process, but she bought me like a book so that I can actually read about like, okay, like how does the process work? What are some things that I'm going to encounter through this process? And just knowing that we, to this day, we still speak and she doesn't even work at the university anymore. Like that, that, that's something that I'm really grateful for, but it really is following up. And don't think because someone doesn't answer the first time, like you can't like follow up again. Like, cause we like to think that we're being annoying, but be annoying. Like if you really want someone to be your mentor, you're gonna have to follow up. Cause for the most part, they also have lives too. And they, they're pretty busy, so. And I would also say just quickly that, you know, even if you go to a, a big university like Albany or any big university, like, you know, you're not necessarily just a number, like you can change that. You don't have to just be a number in the, you know, in the thousands of students that are there. It is what you make of it and, you know, making yourself, nobody's saying be the president of the student association, but like, you know, be in clubs, be, you know, speaking to professors, speaking um, just in different places. So you're speaking to people, not you know, in places like on a stage, but speaking to people and making people, know, you know, aware who you are, your your resident, your resident, um, resident director, even like, you know, in your hall, like who else, your RA, it doesn't matter, just speak to people, because that will be the thing I think that um, can help you. And it will be the thing that helps you in the long run, too. Um, we had some people joining us on Facebook, so I wanted to thank those that joined us live, um, and thanks to Nora, Maria, and Alex for their great comments. So um, Monica and um, Allison, when you guys get a chance, hop over to Facebook and take a look. There was a fellow alum, Alex, from Class of 91, Monica, so you have to go check them out. <laughs> thank you both so very much for, for joining us tonight. Um, I really feel like this is just such invaluable information. Um, truly appreciate you joining the Alumni Association and doing this tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.